Hello, I'm Richard Ayuardi, the international face of technology from the legendary television programme Gadget Man. But I speak to you now with a new thirst in my throat, and that thirst can only be quenched by travel. Although I essentially view holidays as a time-hungry absurdity, even I can dream of cheerier places than Britain. Well, I'm turning these dreams into a televisual coup by journeying to some of the most exotic... I came here for a party in the sky. ..and, crucially, nearby destinations available at time of recording. So we're basically guinea pigs. Each week, I'll selflessly show you, with brutal efficiency, how to enjoy one weekend away with the smallest outlay of coin and effort. Oh! Welcome to Travel Man. I am very impressed. Yeah, this is dynamite. This time, 48 hours amidst the wild and wanton scenery of Iceland. And because she had nothing else on, I'm joined by actress Jessica Hines. I can feel the volcano vibrational I energy. Can't feel it. With whom I will take to the skies. This seems a steep descent. Chase elusive wildlife. That will be a moment that you will never forget and consume inedible food. Both those things are awful. As we reveal how to get in and out of Iceland as efficiently as possible while allowing brief pockets of enjoyment. We're here, but should we have come? Iceland can be reached from Britain by getting a train to Denmark and then a two-day ferry crossing, or by cruise ship. Or regular saps like us can get there on an aircraft like this aircraft. I'm so excited. About going to Iceland? Yes. Have you been before? Never. No. Three hours isn't classed as long haul, but it's an eternity if you're forced to sit next to someone with my conversational skill set. So Jessica politely pretends to brush up on her Icelandic. Yeah. What's the matter? I'm lonely. That's what's the matter with me. I'm very lonely. With feet now on Scandinavian soil, Jessica and I can begin to extract full value from this not-that-icy land. So, have you got a body in there? What's it? <laughs> oh, Dave, this is my toothbrush. I've got a very powerful pneumatic toothbrush. Oh, good. That keeps my teeth this level of perfection. Excellent. So, why have you brought us to Iceland? Well, let me tell you now. Well, in answer to Jessica's frankly passive-aggressive question, there's a whole hold-all of reasons. Firstly, for the time poor or readily bored, Iceland condenses a lot of amazing scenery into a relatively small area. Secondly, for those with one or both eyes on fiscal stricture, it's much more affordable than it used to be. One of the many great things about the financial crash of 2008 is that it made Iceland a cheaper, if not actually cheap, place to visit. Now, Jessica, I have to look out of the window when I'm in a car, which can give off the impression of being extremely imperious, but it is better than me vomiting on you. So I'm going to maintain a somewhat aloof gaze out into the middle distance. I appreciate that. But I'm going to ask you, what are your first impressions of Iceland? It's not very built up. It's not built up. I'd say there are very few high-rises thus far. It just seems to be nature everywhere. We want to maximise our exposure to Icelandic scenery, so we're staying out of town, in a hotel where said scenery will be clearly visible through the massive windows. The Hotel Ion was originally built as accommodation for workers at the nearby geothermal power station, which heats the hotel and 90% of Reykjavik. Jessica, I can't get misty-eyed. Our time is short. I've delivered what you've asked for, which is a modern hotel, 45 minutes from the city in a post-apocalyptic setting. Happy? Very happy, Richard, yes. Have I got time to put my boots on? You have three minutes. Do you feel settled in? Yeah, it's, the room's beautiful, amazing view. There's a spa here. Well, I don't like this talk of being settled in because I equate that idiomatically with boredom. Let's explore. It's not just about fun. Much as I'd like to stay inside among the minimalism, muted tones and complimentary Wi-Fi, it seems appropriate to take in a bit of the outside. Well, 
you'd be accurate in describing this as cold. It's brisk. It's pretty bracing. In spite of the cold, people come to Iceland to experience the aggressive and stunning landscapes. And while you can do this via dog sled or snowmobile, most choose a bus tour. The most popular tour is of the Golden Circle, a round trip of some of Iceland's most spectacular natural features. But that takes up to eight hours. So I've got a better idea. Look. For a mere 10 times the price of a sluggish coach, we jointly commend you to charter a copter. By taking to the skies, we can complete the Golden Circle tour in just one hour, seven hours quicker than the bus. Oh. Imagine we could just be going along at a sedate pace, not encountering the frankly valuable lesson that life can end at any moment. <laughs> Our first stop on the Golden Circle tour is the home of Iceland's most famous water features, the geysers. Jess, shall we go and check out this geyser that everyone's going on about? Yes. OK, let's vacate the copter. These geysers are liquidy illustrations of Iceland's active landscape and have been spewing out magma-heated water here for 10,000 years. We're here, Jess, at the biggest geyser in Iceland. At the diamond geyser. The Ray Winstone, if you will of Iceland. Wow, I bet get the camera out. Well, I don't think it's going to go off anytime soon. It oh. last erupted 70 foot high in the air in 2000. I'm going to take you to the second biggest geyser, the Danny Dyer, if you will, and that erupts every three minutes, much like Danny Dyer, only joking, he's just an actor. He, 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 he's not like that. He's in control. <laughs> That's Strocka for you. Strocka. Regular as you like. I imagine that um, you'll be wanting to document this with a picture of yourself, with that in the background. That's what you. Well, the memory of it's certainly not going to be enough. It's not sufficient. We no must way. document it. I'm going to gift you now. Yeah. The M Pod goes around your smartphone. Thus, you can attach that to any object, a bench, a branch, and so on, and also the Halo remote. How does it work, Richard? Well, that's already clipped in. Yeah. You clip that sure. to a tripod or something else, yeah. and then you navigate click using on that. this okay. remote. Do you yeah. think I could just perch it somewhere on you if I just... Okay. Clip it on. Perfect. OK. okay. <laughs> oh, look. It's swelling. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Bang! I hope you didn't blow it. With three minutes wasted on frippery, we must return to the Terracopter and continue on our so-called way. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. We are journeying to a valley where the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates are tearing the world apart. And that is straight from Wikipedia. They're moving towards each other or kind of, they're about to collide. All I remember is that in geography, that's where you did extra special shading. Moving 2.5 centimetres a year is a rollicking romp in geological terms. Another Golden Circle tour stop checked off without even touching the ground. But I demand yet more speed. Wow, look at that. That's a whole heap of boiling water. Gorgeous. I, I, I'm really enjoying looking at it. It's just the the petrol fumes and the thought of tumbling to my death is taking the edge off the admittedly tremendous natural splendor. But it's pretty good. We are ending the Golden Circle Tour here at Golfos, a waterfall with a 32 meter drop over its two steps, fed by Iceland's second biggest glacier. <laughs> this seems a steep descent. <laughs> this seems too steep. Well, here we are. What a view. It's pretty good. Yeah. Look at those saps on the <laughs> other side, all in a big line, ostensibly closer to it. With a better view. On the face of it, it looks like that. But not only can we see that, we can also see them and the car parking facility and the visitor centre. Sure. And we have the added bonus of no protective barrier, so it keeps <laughs> it alive and jangly. Now I'm really... You, you're that pleased we, we were in the copter. It would have been weird not to have travelled by helicopter. Why doesn't everyone do it? 
What do you feel, Richard? Do you feel...? I feel pretty cold. That's what I feel. Yeah. It's a cracking display of nature. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> words like vitality, oh. vivacity, water, those sorts of words, certainly. And I'm thinking of words like inside, heating, tea. Travelling in a copter has enabled us to drink in the Golden Circle experience while saving ourselves seven hours of valuable Icelandic daylight. A tour de force in time-trimming travel. Shall we, um... Shall we go? Yeah, we don't yeah. have too much fun. My nose is, is, yeah. is so cold, it's gonna I can't feel it. I'm gonna... <laughs> Golden Circle successfully circumnavigated, our two separate minds turned to food. Eating on holiday is a miasma of uncertainty, but Jessica insists on booking an authentically Icelandic dinner. Hi. Hi. This is Hauka. Hauka? Yes, and this is Brennivin, but also known as Black Death. Hauka, or Greenland shark, is poisonous when fresh owing to high levels of uric acid but by simply leaving it to decay and hanging it out to ferment for a few months, it becomes technically edible. Why won't this kill me? Um, I'm, I'm not really sure. No, it's just I fine. Ask. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you don't, you won't eat this, will you? No, I no. don't like it. No. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good sign. Both those things are awful. Those are two awful things here. <laughs> Good. That feels terrible. Grief. It was like a jelly cube of ammonia. And this is made from mashed potato. I would quite like this. I wish this was made back into mashed potato. This, so I don't I could mind. We can eat something. We could just go to the tapas bar that's there. And I would like that. Cold beers. And, I would like that. Yeah. I would like that. You're going to take your coat or. Are you going to leave? If you could bring it that way. I'll, I'll bring it for you. It's certain that neither Jessica nor I will ever chow down on Rotten Shark again. I'm not paying. Thank you. Bye, Björk. But it's another time-efficient cultural experience that we can pretend was important for some reason. Next, we need to make full use of Iceland's winter darkness and head out on a quest to witness the wonder of the Northern Lights, a monumental natural light display caused by the collisions of the solar wind and our planet's magnetic field and atmosphere. Jessica, we're here beneath the majesty that is the night sky. Oh, I just saw a shooting star. No. I did. It could, I'm sure it wasn't a plane? It was definitely a shooting star. Okay. That's a bright one up there. I see you're getting a bit technical there. Yeah. I you tell obviously you got what. some star knowledge. Oh, oh another one. one. Did you just see one? I did see another that. Another shooting star. Where's it going? When they shoot, where are they off to? They're just dying. Oh. It's the end of them. That's a shame. Yeah. And just to think, all of these billions of stars are of no use to us. They're rubbish. There's nothing on them. It makes you think how great we are. <laughs> That's whenever I look into the sky, <laughs> I think how much bigger we are than all of this mm. nonsense. <laughs> I'm valiantly compressing an Icelandic holiday into 48 hours with actress Jessica Hines. You rejoin us now during a so far so fruitless pursuit of the celestial shindig that is the Northern Lights. We've packed it in though, haven't we? Yeah, like a tin of sardines. Yeah, like a tin of rotting sardines, <laughs> fermenting nicely. No sign of the Northern Lights yet, but of course the camera can sometimes see things that the naked eye doesn't. So we may be having this experience, but our retina are letting us down. As if planned in advance, the time lapse I set up was experiencing the spectacle on our behalves. The machines have beaten us once more. It's like Terminator all over again. In a sense, I feel like I've been cheated by nature. Now we have recorded evidence that something actually happened, we can go to bed. After a short and troubled sleep, rosy-fingered dawn slaps us awake again. Jessica, we've had an Icelandic blast. 
Yes, we have. I think it's been relatively comprehensive, but we have not as yet drunk in any folklore or culture. Well, we could go and visit the Hand Knitting Association of Iceland and make an authentic Lopapesa jumper. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit route one. We could, if we were going to go off-piste culturally, yeah. Yeah. go to Bad Taste Records, yeah. which is the home of the Smekgalesa uh, record label, yes. which is yeah. where. Yeah. Um, do you think they will laugh if they weren't yeah, laughing I, my th joke? I think they're slightly mocking at the unnecessary increase in volume when you go into Icelandic. <laughs> it's incredible. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, they've just, they've just walked out in absolute fury <laughs> at the desecration of their mother tongue. But um, and this record shop, yeah. home of the Smikalesa yes. record label, yeah. um, which, who discovered sugar cubes yes. and therefore Bjork sure. and also Sigil Ross. Of so course. that's as culture of a, of a tasty kind. I Are don't you into want that? to do those things. Okay. Do you yeah. know what I want to do? What do you want to do, Rich? I want to go to elf school. Welcome to the elf school. 54% of Icelanders believe in elves and 90% are open to the idea. To my disappointment, this educational establishment did not teach Will Ferrell his craft, but it does teach visitors to the island about these made-up creatures. Our teacher, Magnus, is one of Iceland's foremost experts on these non-beings. I've met nearly 900 Icelanders that have seen elves. The smallest one is 5 or 8 centimetres, which is flower elves. The biggest one is about 70 or 80 centimetres tall, which is house elves. Within the elf community, is there um, a lot of discord? Do they have a criminal justice system, health care? Yes, they seem to have, because there are elf doctors. For the next 30 minutes, Magnus regales us with fantastical facts on elves in Iceland. But now it's time for Jess and I to go head to head in the final exam to see who will take home that all-important elf diploma certificate. And if there's one thing I must return to the airport with, it's this Pyrrhic victory. What was the name of the elf king in the North Iceland? City? King Thekudusu. King Thoratlu II. That was okay. quite close, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. What is the size of an elf? Um, well, flowers Depending, are six the flowers to are eight centimetres. The nature ones are ten centimetres. And then there's also house elves, house elves 70, who are 70 to 80, 80 centimetres. Yes, you have obviously done your homework in the school. I feel you're slightly just uh, riding my jet stream there, Jessica. Where are most believing elves in the Western countries outside Iceland? Canada, America, Scotland, Scotland. Scotland. Island. Yeah. Bam, as Kanye would say. Bam. And where in the world is normally elves has a similar belief as in Iceland? Aborigines. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for coming to the school. I'm sorry it turned nasty there, Jessica. I just really wanted to win. <laughs> I hope you learned something. I did not. Mixed feelings about that. Where do you stand on elves now? No, I'm not standing on any elves right. because yeah. they don't exist. That's fighting talk. And I'm pleased you didn't raise that with Magnus in there, because he was a big guy. So having experientially conquered folklore, it's time to go on a day trip, but in much less time than a day. 25% of tourists visiting Iceland go whale watching. So as cold-hearted analysts of the travel experience, it is our duty to see what the fuss is about. I'm happy not to see a whale. You may pretend, but inside, really? that will be a moment that you will never forget. Really? You see, you're not going to be standing there going, what's the point? Just wait. I don't I believe may, you. I may even yawn. Connoisseurs of the deep claim there are 23 different species of whale beneath us. Blue, killer, sperm, and a whole bunch of other customers. So I'm hoping to wrap this shiz up pronto. 40 minutes in, we spot movement among the waves. Whale! Dolphin. Saw it. Dolphins. Dolphins. Look at the dolphins! Yeah. Oh, look, wow. Oh, look That's pretty good. Oh, that was good. They're beautiful. Look. This one's coming towards us. Yeah. This one's pretty angry. You cannot disguise your That's pretty thrill. Good. No, the tears are from the wind. <laughs> they may not be the whales we were seeking but they are still water-based mammals, and thus I'm marking it as a victory in my embossed achievement diary. How long has that whole experience taken? Well, the whole thing's been very time efficient. I think we've done this within an hour. We've left harbour, we've spotted dolphins, and now we can take that experience back to land. 
and we can turn it into anecdotes, which ultimately is what a holiday's about. <laughs> As the end of our trip draws near, we must assess the merits of Iceland as a destination, and to do this, we must retire to an attraction some might consider relaxing. This is the Blue Lagoon, a geothermically heated pool and spa. The cloudy water is coloured by natural silica and minerals that have risen from two kilometres beneath the earth. It's like a bunch of white people drowning in milk. I can't wait to get in there. Really? Yeah, I can feel it. I can feel the the volcano vibrational you energy. Can't feel it. I can, no, I can. No, you can't. It's very good for skin conditions, so I think there's probably a lot of people in here with eczema. Yeah, and that's an inviting prospect, mm. to share a milky pond with a bunch <laughs> of dead skin flakes. And we're going to be part of it. OK, well, you've got two minutes to change and ten minutes to relax. Report back. I'm going to get into my sports shorts. OK. Very happy. You're enjoying this, are you? This is the only place this happens in the world. Yeah. Geothermal, seawater coming up, healing us all. I don't enjoy communal showers, <laughs> being confronted with a whole wall of penis. It's very difficult to narrow down the richness of this holiday to a few highlights. But if you had to, what would they be? This has probably been the this highlight. This is it something that any amateur rugby team takes for granted <laughs> every weekend has been your highlight. What was your favourite bit, Richard? I did like the breakfast buffet, that was good. The fish was incredible, all, all the fresh fish. Oh, there must have been something more than the breakfast, but I'm really struggling. The quibbling must cease. We have not come here to enjoy ourselves. We must assess Iceland. It's been a heady mix of explosive landscapes. I hope you didn't blow it. Rotten meals. Both those things are awful. And fantastic nonsense. I hope you learned something. I did not. But overall, this has been a time-efficient triumph, and in the advisory capacity we're for some reason claiming to adopt, we're pronouncing Iceland a must-do two-day destination, or MDTDD for short. Who knows, maybe it'll become a catchphrase. Jessica, time to get in the Jeep. Hello, I'm Richard Ayuadi, and while I've secured an eternal place in history as a blank-faced technological sociopath called Gadget Man, I've decided to widen my brief yet further by flinging myself wantonly and thoroughly into the ungoverned nonsense you people call travel. Despite having a Howard Hughesian approach to leaving my home, I too can yearn to quit these shores and head to cheerier climes. And now I'm going to build this dream of escape as I jet off within a commercial aircraft to some of the most exotic yet near to my house destinations on this earth. To demonstrate how to enjoy one cherished weekend away with the smallest outlay of coin, minutage and faff. This time a whirlwind weekend in the heat of Marrakesh. I'm hitting Africa with actor Stephen The Face Mangan. Hello, ladies. Who will act as a kind of straight man while we relentlessly experience the sights. I came here for a party in the sky. Sounds. Oh, here we go. And smells. My septum's burnt out. Of what is very much a place. That face tells me you made the wrong decision. As we attempt to lead you through an optimal 48 hours in Marrakesh. We're here. But should we have come, you're going to regret that jumper. Marrakesh can be reached by mule trek from the Atlas Mountains. Or, if time is of no immense value to you, you could very well just drive to Barcelona and catch a ferry. But because I have a fetish for heights, I insisted on the relative speed of a three-and-a-half-hour flight, as did Stephen Mangan with whom I wait for a lift to our flop house. We've really flown four hours to stand in front of a sign in the middle of a dual carriageway. We need it for geography. Here it comes. Here's our wheels. Really? Yeah. 
Whoa, 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 whoa. Why do we need those wheels? We need traction. Where are we going? Up the Atlas Mountains? Ish. After you. Richard, you brought me to Marrakesh. Why? Well, I have some very good reasons. Tell me. First things first. Despite being an insultingly short three and a half hours flight away, we're in a different continent and on the cusp of the Sahara Desert. And as if that shiz wasn't enough, Morocco is the world's largest exporter of tin sardines. And now to unveil, we're down, we shall flop. Tourists off kip in the city's bustle. But in a bid to evade other people, I've plumped for a quiet desert oasis, just a short drive from town. So, Richard, where are you taking me? We're going to a hotel that has no electricity. It's candles, gas light. It's adventurous. It's the kind of thing I thought you'd like. I do, but I just feel that there's a shallow grave waiting for me. Yes. At the end of this, we're going to see Gwyneth Paltrow's head in a box. Yeah. La Pause cannily combines luxury with absolute silence. What have you got in that, by the way? Just my hair dryer. Cos it's not a change of clothes, is it? There's 15 more of these suits in this. Oh, right. I change every two hours because I sweat so badly. It's almost as if... ..everyone who was here died. There's no-one around. No. This looks like where Cooler Shaker come to find the new sound. Apparently Prince came here once. Right. I often think that if you and I had a child, it would look like Prince. I think that would be the least of its problems. Shall we see if there's any Wi-Fi? Sure. With our bags duly dropped and evening fast approaching, our bellies ache for appeasement. Marrakesh is famous for its mesmerising array of street food and the best stalls are located in the city's ancient main square. So we return to the urban hubbub and last nearly 12 seconds before the warren of 11th century streets renders us hopelessly lost. Do you know where we are? No. But Sweet Mercy has provided me with a digital compass and map. I'm on compass duty. My map says that way, but my heart says that way. Let's go with the map rather than your rotten heart. What they should do is they should mark the floor like they do in Ikea. With footprints? Yeah, so that you know exactly where you're going. But if it's anything like Ikea, we'd visit every single street in the city before getting to where we wanted to go. Yes, but at least you'd only visit it once rather than several times, which is what we've done. As we flap about like cider soaked to wasps... Let's go this way. Why go that way? It's the way we just come from. All right, let's go... Well, we're lost. What difference let's do this democratic right, we'll go down go this, this way. way. I can only hope that editing spares you the pain of watching this in its entirety. They say it's better to travel than to arrive, but I think in this case they're wrong. Yes. We finally arrive as the sun sets, with all sense of time and perspective in tatters. It's great. Oh, right. Is this where we were meant to end up? Yeah. OK. Pretty good, huh? This square, called the Jamar El Fnar, is the epicentre of Marrakesh, where locals and tourists come to eat. This is a thousand years old, the square. We're trying to keep going until we have a panic attack and then we'll just rest in that area. Snail broth, spicy lamb sausage and stuffed camel spleen are all available for the chomp. But then Stephen's eyes meet the eyes of a sheep. It's a sheep's brain. You'd eat brain? Yeah. Let's eat some brain. Right. Here we go. We'd like some head, please. Yeah. Some tongue, brain. Yeah. Do, do you what have up, face? I might ask for the uh, salad. You'll eat rump with a cow. I won't eat rectum, though. Here we go. Good night. Wow. Can I interest you in some eyelid? Yeah, the brain. Right. Brain. What's this bit round here? Meat. Meat jiggle, yeah, huh? Shoulder. Uh, shoulder. Shoulder. Yeah. OK, back to the shoulder. OK, I've got a bit of uh, brain here. Let me know how that is. Bon appetit. That face tells me you made the wrong decision. It is slightly disconcerting that the mouth is open. It's as if the mouth of this sheep is going, oh, come on. Yeah. Tell me what you've gained from this experience. An anecdote? 
I've got an anecdote. I was with someone stupid enough to eat sheet spray. That's my anecdote. Look, the eye's still in it. This is basically just an autopsy. Don't eat that, OK? I eat the brain, you eat the eyes. I'm not subject to some kind of weird television law of bullying Have where it. just because Declan has eaten the brain, the ant has to eat the eye. No. Oh, my oh, good grief, okay. it's black inside. Why are you doing this? Why, are you do why did you do that? It's delicious. It's not. It is. Should I get a burger? Yeah, let's get a camel burger. OK, come on then. Dinner defeats us. The night and our first day is over. We retire to the pitch black of our desert abode. Day two begins in the middle of day one's night. But the pain of a 4 a.m. alarm will be offset by the eye-gasm that awaits us. Just a one-hour drive out of town. We're getting in a hot air balloon. Wow. In the name of efficiency, because once we're up there, we can see the whole of Marrakesh, oh. mountains, oh, right. the city. How will we go where we want to go? Wind will govern us. Pilot Maurice insists on an early start, as the calm morning air should ensure a safe flight. How long have you been piloting hot air balloons? It's uh, the first time today. A crown prince of deadpan, Maurice also moonlights as Morocco's second best Terence Stamp lookalike. I do now know for certain that I am a vertigo sufferer. Right. What I'm enjoying is the tranquility, the really freaky silence, and then the quite violent uh, flame throwing that's going on just inches above our head. Wow, look, you can genuinely see everything. I wish I had a similar device to this in normal conversations to provide thinking time. Yeah. It's admittedly very beautiful to look at. Mm -hmm. Maurice, I'm trying to have a Joycean epiphany here, but the beauty is largely offset by fear. OK. Although that is the sound of us not falling, so I welcome that sound. Right, OK. We must be able to see almost all of Morocco from up here. With only wicker between us and certain death. Literally. But now that we've got all of this perspective, how are we going to zone in on the detail? How are we, Richard? With this puppy, the Panasonic Lumix 60 times optical zoom. Oh, I mean, it's an absolute pleasure. Look at that. Oh, look at the zoom on that. Oh. Ooh. Wow. Ooh. That's a deep barrel. That is uh, an early morning barrel right there. A bit awkward now, having to stand this close to each other <laughs> after that. I thought you'd be able to mingle in one of these things and walk yeah. around and chat, but we're actually hemmed it's in not, quite small... It's not small... like a function. <laughs> what do you think That's it is? I thought. You, you thought, thought you came up here to network? I came here for a party in the sky. Well, it's more like a confessional booth in the sky. With our memories committed to data, Maurice lets the balloon nestle down. I feel more and more relieved as we get nearer the ground. I'm feeling kind of almost smug. <laughs> and this eerie experience ends without injury. Brace for impact. Whoa! I, I am enjoying my feet touching land. Oh, but wasn't it magical being up in the sky and so quiet and floating? It, it was periodically quiet that was between lovely. Bunton burner blasts. Yeah, that was Hang quite on. noisy. We're going to get... Here we go. The balloon massively fulfilled its brief of allowing us to see a good deal and all before any such thing as breakfast. Actor Stephen Mangan and me, a loose string of unrelated vowels, Richard Ayuadi, are showing you how to power slam through 48 hours in Marrakesh. Our voyage has so far seen us fly... Wow, look. ..and throw food into our mouths. Why are you doing this? But now we must wrestle with local culture, folklore and narrative so we can feel worthy rather than the trivial consumers we are. Storytelling is a crucial part of Marrakesh's history, 
passing on wisdom and moral guidance to new generations. In the 11th century, tellers would perform in the main square, but now a new breed perform in city centre cafes like this. Who doesn't like a story? Well, that's essentially what you and I do for a living, isn't it? Don't dignify what we do. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Jerwood puts on free performances for tourists in his spare time. Hello. 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 I'm Richard. Hello. Hi. Nice, to, nice meet to meet you. Hello, I'm Stephen. Hello. How are you? Nice to meet you. So, I should say, I have no facial expressions. He doesn't. Virtually none. It's like a medical So condition. you won't be able to tell anything <laughs> from looking at me, cos I'm emotionally cut off. Yeah. Okay. Like, almost and completely dead. I'll try and make up for it with my... <laughs> Stephen's with, more animated. With warm eyes. <laughs> also, I'm bad with eye contact, so... Yeah. Just bear that in mind. So, once upon a time, there was a child. His father died and left him alone. This particular story follows Jaffa, a lazy son of a butcher, whose mother encourages him to seek out his own luck. Jaffa, you fool! You always lose your money. Throughout the tale, Jedward skips between roles like a modern-day Danny Dyer, flitting from dog... Woof, woof! Go away, you stupid! ..to old man. Give me money first. The story has more twists and turns than an episode of Come Dine With Me. And guess what he found? Dead Queen. Not the Sopranos. With new characters constantly appearing. He found a white-bearded wizard, holding a candle and a spellbook in his hand. Well, we weren't I mean, going to guess that. that. But like Oliver Stone before him, Jerwood is keen to explore what moral lessons we've gained from his story. What did you learn from this story? So the moral of the story is always find a tiny wizard to take the punishment for you. Yeah. <laughs> and I suppose in a Bruno Bettelheim way, it's really about integrating various aspects of the ego to create a whole. And that's what I took away. I have no idea what this means. No, I right? neither. I didn't really, I just read it in a Sunday yeah. supplement. Our moral compasses clearly need adjustment, but as that will not happen within our lifetimes, it's an issue that is best ignored for the moment. Right now, I urgently wish to explore Marrakesh's top tourist attractions. How about the 16th century Sardian tombs? This is where members of the Sardian dynasty that once ruled Morocco are buried and is a great way to feel close to death for half an hour. OK. Sardian tomb. Right. Very tranquil, very pretty. And their solution to what do you do with the rich dead? You tile them in. You tile them you in. You get a lot of tiles and a job lot of grout. No one really knew that these were the tombs right. until they were discovered in 1917 by a French surveyor, effectively, an aerial survey. So it's quite an extraordinary discovery, I guess. Have you got any particular burial plans? I want to go in the brown recycling bin. I've said this for a long time. Knowing my luck, I'd end up in the wrong bin and they wouldn't really refuse to pick me up. Our 48 hours are nearly up. Like Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte before us, we can't waste them by over-reflecting on the fleeting nature of life. No, we need to investigate the production of high-quality leather goods, something Marrakesh is world-famous for. So our next stop is the thousand-year-old tannery on the edge of the old town, where we'll learn how some of the finest leather on earth is created. Well, this is the tannery. OK where leather goods are prepared. Is that on the walls? That's excrement. Excrement? Yeah. Right. I once lived in a block of flats in Southfields that had a very similar stairwell to this. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, it wasn't ideal. Oh, It's God. an intense whiff. How oh, intense isn't the word. My septum's burnt out. The tanners here use medieval techniques which have been passed down through generations. The first stage of the process is to soak the goat, camel or cow skins in lime to loosen the hair. Wow, the hair is just the gliding is off. Like soaking a casserole dish. Well, before long, it'll be a Hoxton man bag. There's bits of my body that could do with that treatment. Yeah. It's the next stage now where they dip the skin in pigeon 
faeces. Right. To remove the lime, and that is a ramp up in odour. Oh, hello. The last time I smelt something like this, I was in the toilets of an unmanned railway station in the Midlands. After they are washed, the skins are soaked again, left to dry, and finally scraped before having colour applied. The smell's still horrific, but there's more leather within it. Bono will be able to get a pair of trousers made out of these. Yep. In order to see the leather in its final state, we make haste to the sprawling city centre markets. Well, you couldn't really get more leather. <laughs> if only Paul Hogan were here, he could really stock up. There's so much leather here that some men, including the man Leonardo DiCaprio, pay locals to sift through it for them. But I'm not Leonardo DiCaprio, and if anyone's going to sift through man bags, it's going to be me. OK, this, this makes me feel like a, a 70s doctor, which I like. This is good. And how this, how this much is this? Good. Yes. This one is only 6.50, you know. 6.50? 6 oh, Let do. me get my app out oh, and see how much out. that is. £46. Pounds. Give me your best offer, how much? If you just let me get to 375 to make it look like I'm good at haggling, yeah. I'll give you 500 OK. Dear. 500 okay. Great. I'm not even sure I want the bag. Well, Stephen, if you could pay up... Right. Yeah, I work for him. Uh, he's very cruel, and if I do things wrong, he hits me. With the piece of Marrakesh now strapped to my torso, we need to ponder our enormous achievements in a suitably evocative environment. So we've travelled back to the Agafé Desert, where we can test one last experience. How are you feeling about our way out? Hello, ladies. Yeah. Wow, look at you. Look at the eyelashes on that one. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, just for filtering out dust rather than aesthetics, but I'm sure they'll appreciate the compliment. It's working for me. When we mount up, and right. mount up we will, right. we're going to be high off the ground. Yeah. So I don't want to leave a, a face like yours in danger of hitting the deck. How are you going to protect my face? The pro-hit air vest. Really? Well, go around your body. Your face actually still might get mangled. Horse riders wear this. So when you fall off, it inflates, thus buffering you. We're going to get on? All right, mount up. Here we go. Whoa, hey! This one. Mine's is half up. Way and now he's fully oh, up. But his face is caught in your. <laughs> Look at this. Get up. I'm just like a big gnat to this camel. Camel rise. Camel. Camel light. Up you get. <laughs> Here we go. There we go. Here we oh, go. Hello. Hello. Are you ready? It's high. Ooh. It's a long way up. Oh dear. There we go. Oh yeah. You see. How do you feel now? You're mounted up. Well, I think this is the closest I'm ever going to get to being in a Western. Yeah. I mean, I feel pretty good about this, actually. Yeah? I feel less bad than I normally do, which, for me, is a ringing endorsement. I wonder how recently they've uh, drunk. You know, one of these puppies can fit in 200 litres. 200 litres? It's going to neck that in three mins. In three mins? Three mins. Camels are so vital to Moroccans that there's an annual camel festival celebrating their importance as a means of transport and source of food. Mentally, though we dare not admit it to one another, Mangan and I are already working out how to bring this event to Britain and whether we could get Cooler Shaker to reform and lay down some sweet beats. I feel, of all the things we've done, this is one of the least terrifying. That's really weird to hear you say that. Less terrifying than the storyteller. No, that was OK. Less terrifying than walking through a Medina. Yes. Less terrifying than buying a leather bag. That was medium. Good to know how the charts are. Look at it, look at that, look at that. See, aren't you glad you're not sitting in your living room now and you're out here in the desert on a camel? What I'm glad about is the image of you looking like an off-duty member of the Metropolitan Police hey. on the back of a camel. Camel division. Overall, Marrakesh can afford the frugal traveller with a whole tankard of holiday for a mere cup of coin. It may not have been entirely pleasant. Oh, God. Intense whiff. But we enjoyed a hot air balloon. Well, ooh. A high-quality leather man bag. I'm not even sure I want the bag. And a whole sheep's head. I eat the brain, you eat the eye. No. Eat it. No. Eat the eye. I'm not eating. Eat the eye. So, you're a man who, wherever you go, clutches life lessons dearly to his chest. Which one have you plucked this time? 
We think we've seen it all because you've watched it on telly, you've seen documentaries, but not until you get out there and see it with your own two eyes can you really appreciate what's going on in the world. What about you? I've learned that it's very frustrating to be without Wi-Fi signal.